Talk Time. Hi, and welcome to Talk Time, a podcast from Signals. I'm Fraser Merrick, Education Coordinator at Signals, and Talk Time is a podcast exploring the history of communication tech here in Tendering, Essex. In today's episode, I'll be talking to Steve James from Essex Raynet, a voluntary sector emergency communication service. We'll be speaking about the development of amateur or ham radio and the important role it played in the 1953 floods. Hi, Steve. Thank you for joining me today. Hi, Fraser. Thanks very much for inviting me in. So I just want to start off. Could you tell me what is amateur radio? Oh, there's a wide ranging question. (laughs) Uh, It's a hobby that uh, allows people who have an interest in radio, electronics, science, these days, computing, maker community. So if you're Raspberry Pi or Arduino or just communications generally, if you've got an interest in that sort of thing, it spurs people to take the next step, which is to get a license uh, in the UK to operate so you can actually transmit on radio. And and surprisingly, in the world of of mobile phones, it's still very popular. Now, whether you're licensed, you then get allocated a whole range of uh, frequencies or radio bands that you're entitled to use. And these range, I think, in in sort of three areas. There's the long distance stuff. So there are big aerials that people would with big gardens can have, and that will reach right around the world. Uh, You've got short distance radio, so things like walkie talkies, and uh, you can use it in your car. Uh, And they use little mobile repeaters run by local amateur groups. And then very recently, there's some new technologies where you can have some digital radio, where the radio network plugs into the internet. So instead of doing it the hard way, long distance, big aerials, you literally go from your handheld radio to something local, That's connected to the internet, and that then breaks out um, in the country that you've selected and then rebroadcasts on radio in that country. So um, you could dial in New York, and it would pop out as a radio channel for amateur radio in New York, and um, the world's your oyster. So that's a a recent um, development. It's really fascinating kind of like patchwork of technologies there as well, this kind of combination of of old and new to facilitate that radio connection using a cable essentially all the way to to New York. Now to be able to do that you need a license and um, over the last 10 years they've made it a lot easier for people to join the hobby and now you've got um, a thing called a foundation license which is uh, an entry level thing. Uh, There are free online courses, takes about eight weeks to learn the basics of radio, some safety, some regulations and some operational theory multi-choice question, you try the, uh, the, um, the exam online, and when you press return, it tells you instantly if you've passed. You then send an email to Ofcom, and they will then send you a call sign by return, which is free. So bingo, you're on the air. All you need to do now is buy a radio and off you go. It, it does seem like there's a real a uh, rich community with amateur radio. Uh, that's right. The uh, East of England is very uh, well served in terms of um, local radio groups. In Essex, we've got uh, Essex Ham. In Suffolk, we've got Suffolk Red, plus all the other ones that are also online. And they run special events, um, get-togethers. So you turn up at your local club, and the guys who experience will help the people pulling through understand how to glue it all together. Because once you get your licence, you buy your radio, you now have to put an antenna and feeder. It can be uh, quite daunting when you first start. <laughs> and that's the beauty of local clubs. They can help yeah. you and also lend you stuff that they themselves have bought. Test equipment's quite expensive, but if you split it between 30 or 40 people, you know, it's, it's quite a viable thing. Part of the reason I wanted to speak with you today is because of your affiliation with Essex, Raynet specifically, I wondered if you could tell me a little bit about what Raynet is, and then we'll get into how it came around afterwards. Okay, so Raynet was set up after the the terrible floods of 1953, and we can come back to that. But today, its role is to provide uh, emergency communications to uh, local councils and districts and the emergency services. Uh, And it's all about preparation for that. Now, to be able to do that, what most Raynet groups do is they lend their services to communities and charities for special events. So if there's a fun run or a marathon or a cycle race where they have marshals out on a course, if you want instant communication 
back to the uh, HQ that says somebody's fallen over, broken their leg, or uh, we seem to be three people missing. Um, can you send somebody out or respond with the marshals? The Raynet groups will have put out a, a temporary network, primarily because there's probably no mobile phone coverage in that area, mm. but also for the immediate. If you have um, the first aid people that are sponsored by that event needing to get to places, well, if the marshals are there, it's great if you can actually have people who are trained in communications and understand mapping and, and locations to relay that back to the, uh, the network control to direct the services to that point. So what Raynet does is use those events as training opportunities to practice. But every now and again, they get called out by either district or county emergency planning officers to respond to emergencies. And the most recent was last Wednesday, would you believe? Oh, wow. And there was a major failure of water supply in Hertfordshire and Essex. A pumping station blew up. And oh. that was last Wednesday. And it affected over 50,000 homes. So by 11 o'clock in the morning, no running water, no drinking water, God. nothing to bath or wash in. And particularly for the vulnerable who are isolating because of COVID yes. or because they can't get out, there was a, an urgent requirement to um, put contingency plans in. And I had a phone call from the county emergency planning officer asking me to put the whole organization on standby. So in wow. case we were wanted, we could be then rolled out to provide them with communications um, if needed. So what we do is we've got three levels of uh, call out. There's the alert, which is, oh, so, uh, we get a heads up. Something is coming. So mm -hmm. I'll send that out and say something is coming. Charge your battery, uh, your uniform, find your pass card, but carry on doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Standby means you could be deployed at anywhere. So don't go too far away from uh, the house. Get your go bag ready, get your stuff ready, but carry on, and then call out. And we have um, a cascade messaging system that uh, fires off, notifies everybody, and uh, is clever enough to say, if it, if it can't get hold of your mobile phone, it automatically switches to the landline, switches to email, switches to apps, and so wow. on, and away we go. So what we are able to do is we're trained in the ability of, of carrying messages, setting up radio networks quite quickly, and then deploying. We've got um, equipment that we will give our members. We've got radio masts I have in Essex. We've got a couple of, or more than a couple, of uh, radio repeaters, which we can turn on remotely. So that will give us instant coverage in um, most of the, the county. And that's similarly for other um, Raynet groups. There's about 2,000 members in the UK. And they're split across mostly county boundaries, where each county has got a, an S, um, a Raynet group of their own. It's a purely voluntary group made up of uh, radio amateurs. Uh, we don't get any funding from anywhere, so it's all self-funded. And uh, the, most of the radio equipment is either bought or paid for by the membership. Sometimes we get a few donations, which is very gratefully received. And from that, we buy some of the equipment. But the big thing about Essex Raynet is it's applying the knowledge that you've gained as an amateur radio enthusiast, mm. getting out there and building stuff, and also contributing to the community, You're using your skills to help either charities raise that money or the community by providing emergency comms when something goes wrong. I genuinely didn't know that there'd been such recent activity as well. So that's... Um... You know, it's, it's really, really interesting to hear kind of how relevant the organisation is uh, and, you know, and how useful and needed it is in kind of embedded in that sort of infrastructure, communications, technology infrastructure today. It yeah. still kind of has its place. That, that's right. You would think with, um, with mobile phones, you know, why do you use emergency communications? Well, I think in 2019, which is the year we could, we we're allowed out, we did about, yeah. about 18 different events for communities. But, but within that... I don't know if you remember, in August 2019, there was um, something strange happened at Clacton, Walton and Frinton, where everybody yes, on the beach yeah. suddenly started coughing and spluttering and being sick and headaches. Uh, we were immediately put on standby because they didn't know what it was. Wow. And actually, they've never found out what it was. Yeah. 2017, there was uh, Jaywick floods, and uh, we were called out because of that. October 2018, we had a repeat of what the 1953 floods was going to be. 
So we were all put on standby for that. So it is uh, quite relevant. You mentioned there some of the history, the 1953 floods. So I think it might be a good time maybe to talk about some of the heritage of the organisation. What role did amateur radio play during the 1953 flood? Uh, yes, I think let me put it into context. The East Coast flood, as it was known, was 31st of January 1953, force 11 gales, uh, tidal surge, and 307 people lost their lives on that evening between the 31st of Jan and the 1st of February. Um, from an East Coast point of view, uh, 30,000 people were evacuated. Um, in Norfolk, 5,000 homes were destroyed. In Canvey Island in Essex, the whole population of 11,500 were evacuated because Canvey Island flooded. And throughout that, there were unfortunate lots of drownings and uh, people dying because of that. So you can just imagine the weather that was going on during that point. And the role that amateur radio played is that the police asked the licensed amateurs if they could help. And the reason for that was in 1953, telephone service was delivered on poles, uh, on, on, on the wires. And they were all blown down, either because of the wind or by falling trees taking whole roots out. So there was no telephone service for the whole of that East Coast area. And the police asked the licensed amateurs if they could relay messages from their homes, those that weren't flooded but just on the edge, inland, so the messages could be passed further. Also, that in the North Sea, there were quite a number of ships that were in uh, dire straits. I think it was about 200 um, wow. who were suffering problems. And what happened was the ship-to-shore radios, the radio stations, also went off the air because of loss of power. Mm. And there were examples. Uh, I've got one here in the Humber radio, which was um, a radio uh, communicating with ships, um, was dealing with a distress call when it lost all power. And a local amateur, G3AXS, was monitoring it out of interest and heard the call for medical assistance. He then rang the local hospital, got the directions, and then communicated straight back to the ship directly, knowing that the radio station had gone off the air. He then did four more distress calls with the shipping. So amateur radio looked out into the sea. But also um, examples of amateur radio enthusiasts not only working from their homes, but there's a lovely story of um, in Great Yarmouth, two amateurs took their homemade radios on motorcycles and drove through the floods to assist the emergency services and then providing a link from the locations that they were back in. Uh, two amateurs in North Norfolk were using uh, radio comms to link two locations for food and clothing. And that same story was then replicated across the whole of the East Coast, where radio amateurs were providing the, the only means of communication. It was frustrated, however, because amateur radio was specifically prevented in being able to do this. Mm. A license says you are forbidden to transmit third party messages. License actually requires you. I can talk to you. You can talk to me, but I can't tell you anything that's nothing to do with you or I. And one of the things that came out of that is, thankfully, common sense prevailed and amateur radio enthusiasts just bypassed that part of their license. And they pressurized the Home Office into doing something about it. Uh, the Home Office then asked the Radio Society of Great Britain, RSGB, which is still going today, um, which was where the, the parent body of the amateur radio enthusiasts, could they put a, a committee together and think about how they could do this on a regular basis? And the outcome of that was the formation of RAINET. At that time, it was RAE Net, Radio Amateurs Emergency Network now spelt R-A-Y-N-E-T because it's an easier word to read. So the outcome of all of that in March 1953 was the formation of RAINET and the licenses were amended such that they could use uh, their radios for third-party messages, but only in response to emergency services, and that continues today. And then a big change was a Civil Contingencies Act of 19, oh no, of 2004. What this did, it obliged local councils to have emergency plans to cover many scenarios. And out of that, um, the districts then recruited volunteer groups, such as RAINET and others, 
to be part of their contingency planning. So every district now has a contingency team and a contingency plan that says when the following scenarios happen, you have at least a plan to reach for. Essex, you have the Essex Resilience Forum, which is the district body that looks at that. And they have the Strategic Coordination Group, the SCG, which then sits down with a range of experts and decides how they're going to respond to a major incident. And if it's needed, you know, Essex Raynet is there or other Raynet groups are there to be called in for communications. We have sister groups that do um, four-wheel drive. So the Rover Rescue, which is part of the Essex 4x4 Club, oh, wow. they provide emergency transport and so on with other um, emergency, sorry, voluntary bodies. So that's a brief history of Raynet and how it played a part in the um, 1953 floods, which then caused its creation. So uh, we've spoken a little bit about where Raynet came from, you know, it, what sort of caused its beginnings uh, and the role it plays today. What sort of role do you think Raynet will offer in the future? I think it will continue to be needed, particularly with um, opportunities when there are large events going on where the local district council will then, from its own uh, contingency plans, need the fact that uh, there's an opportunity to provide or pre-provide a network. For instance, if you're at a a massive uh, country show and you imagine that one of the scenarios might be there's a fire in the beer tent or something, Uh, how do the council divert the traffic away? How do you stop 20,000 people all phoning home and going, look at my video, you need a nice, crisp, separate communication network that goes from the site to the um, district emergency response centre that's part of their um, contingency plan. And they then have clear communications with experts that can provide that uh, trained ability to not be diverted by what's going on and allow the district or county planning officer to implement those uh, contingency plans and call in the relevant bodies. Uh, The second thing is with the world of uh, social media and the interest in these things, uh, radio is going to the point where it has to go encrypted because there is so much, uh, there are examples of people listening into what's going on and then rebroadcasting that in, in inappropriate places. So there's a need to go from analog radio, which 95% of the radio is analog, uh, to a digital format such there can be secure communications when it's necessary. Yes, yeah. Uh, The ordinary license parameters prevents encryption, which is okay. But then in the case of emergency communications, when you are handling people's names, addresses, descriptions, Mm. that has to be encrypted because, unfortunately, we live in a society where sometimes people misuse that information. That's particularly interesting when you think about the the story you mentioned of the Coast Guard in uh, the River Humber and how if that ship to shore radio had been encrypted, then that amateur wouldn't have been able to hear it and then step in to provide that emergency support. But there's a trade-off, isn't there, between having that and then also, um, like you say, uh, rogue actors who will look to take advantage of, of unencrypted um, communications. That's right. And... Uh... As an aside, one of the things that um, recently uh, reappeared is Morse. Now, Morse was um, what all the uh, ship-to-shore radios were using in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and then it began to fade with the introduction of um, satellite communications to the point around about 2000 when they withdrew the Morse service. But quite recently, that's that's reappeared, and there's, there's great interest in the amateur community of people relearning Morse. Wow. In fact, the um, the chairman of the Essex CW Club, which is the um, Morse Club, is actually a member of Essex Raynet. And uh, every year he holds what's called a boot camp. Boot camp, you come along and you go assume that you're nothing and uh, you work your way through. And that's, um, that's having more and more uh, take-up which is a surprising aside. Yeah, I know um, a mutual friend of ours, Laura Travail, friend of Signals as well. Laura's worked on various projects with us. Um, Laura uh, has a Morse key, which (laughs) they've brought to various events that we've done. I remember Laura showed it to a a primary school in Basildon and um, the children were very confused. (laughs) Couldn't quite wrap their heads around it. Yes, definitely. From one sort of coding to another. Yes, Oh, brilliant. Thank you so much for your time today, Steve. It's been really fascinating to hear about the role that Raynet has played um, throughout its kind of history 
Uh, yeah, really, really fascinating. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fraser. Thank you to Steve from Essex Raynet. If you want to find out more about Essex Raynet and how you can get involved, simply visit their website, which is essexraynet.co.uk, to find out more. As part of the Talk Time project, Signals worked with artist David Norton to create an interactive story exploring the role of technology during the 1953 floods. It works on both laptops and mobile devices, and all you need to do is visit our website to play, which is signals.org.uk. Excitingly, the game was also sound designed by the young sound designers at Clip, a local social enterprise who work with young people to teach them music production skills. They also wrote all the music you can hear in this podcast series too. This podcast was produced and edited by me, Fraser Merrick, and it was funded by Essex 2020 and the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Thanks, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.